Let's read a scripture. We're talking about, it's Palm Sunday. John 12, verse 12. I'll tell you what, I haven't experienced what I'm experiencing now, experiencing now in, a, in a long time. There's a hunger in this place. There's, there's a desire. There's, there's people are hungering, thirsting after God. And he, I'm telling you, when I get up here to preach, I, I can hardly explain what happens. You have to preach to know this. There's times when you preach, you feel like your voice is hitting the back wall and just dropping dead. There's other times it feels like people are just pulling things out of you. There, there's, it gets to the point where I, I have notes, but there's so much being pulled from my spirit that my head gets confused. You have to do it to know what that means. But you guys are pulling right now. You guys are hungry. You want more. You're not satisfied. I love it. Can, you, know, you know, the coach of the, and I'm not saying you were the bad news bears, but when you, when you have a team that's kind of just doing okay and all of a sudden something happens one day and they decide, we, we want to win the championship. We're not just playing baseball here anymore. We want, we want to be the World Series champions and we're willing to do what it takes. What do you want me to do? where I feel like I am right now. John 12, 12. The next day, the, a huge crowd that had arrived for the feast heard that Jesus was entering Jews, Jerusalem. They broke off palm branches and went out to meet him. Hosanna, they cheered, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes, the king of Israel. Jesus got on a, a young donkey and rode it, just as the scripture has said it. No fear, daughter of Zion. See how your king comes riding on a colt. And, and one of the things we have to know, I've been doing a series. You know what? I'll read the other scripture because we'll tie them together. We had a teacher in school. I think I mentioned this before. One day we were in a class. It was Tuesday. He was supposed to be teaching blood covenant. And, and then on Thursdays he was supposed to be teaching charismatic perspectives about the Holy Ghost and the, and on Tuesday, he started teaching charismatic perspective. And about 10 minutes into the class, someone goes, excuse me, sir, is this, isn't this blood covenant? He goes, eh, it's all the same, you know. <laughs> and, and it is. It's the gospel. Yeah. And I, I, we were doing a series in the middle of a series. And the series would be title, entitled The Great Falling Away. And here's the foundation scripture. You don't have to turn there. Second Thessalonians 2. Now, brother, concerning the coming, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for the day will not come unless, there's, unless the falling away comes first. So the Bible tells us right before Jesus comes, many believers who are sitting in churches there's going to be a great falling away. I was talking to Cliff this morning. He said, never have I seen in all my years, 30-something years of ministering, so many people at the same time. There's always one here that backslid, one here messed up, one here decided to do something, and never have I seen so many cases at the same time of people being confused about things, going back to sin, doing whatever it is, just seeing so much of it. So how do these two subjects connect? The same people, and I, and I started to pray. I said, Lord, it's Palm Sunday. Should I preach a different message? Should I leave my series alone? And I felt he said this, there's no greater sermon illustration than to see people yelling, Hosanna, one day, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, taking off their coat, putting it on the floor, putting down palm branches, and to have those same people a week later yelling, crucify him. We're talking about a falling away, a turning from something. And how does that happen? Well, in this case, the reason this happened, you can tell by the, you know, they said that the king of Israel, they were looking for, they wanted to go, they wanted the God to come into their life on their terms. Yes, God, I want you, but I want you to do this, this, and this. This is what I want to happen. We're tired of these Romans. We're tired of being oppressed. 
Thank you for sending us a new king. He's going to gather up a bunch of people, and we're going to go, and we're going to fight until the blood is knee-deep, and we're getting victory, and we're going to overcome, and then Israel's going to be the new ruler in the land. And then Jesus started talking about laying down your life. He's being accused. He's not defending himself. So because God didn't do it exactly the way they wanted to, they were like, ah, get rid of him. They turned on him. So this great falling away is going to happen because people are turning. And what causes people to turn? Um, we read again in, in 1 Corinthians, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. It says they were... All these things were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. All the things they do, they worshiped idols, they were compromising, they did things. He says, I'm writing these, because there's this whole grace thing that's saying, well, none of this stuff really matters, we're under grace. He's saying that you better be careful and learn from what they did, because if you start compromising and giving in to sin and just thinking, well, God will forgive me, he's writing that to the people who live today where we are. He says, if you're... This is not a popular grace message, this scripture right here. If you think you are standing strong, be careful lest you fall. So my goal to share along these lines is to tell you that something's going on that's going to cause many Christians to be deceived. Let's think about who the devil is for a second. You know, we're going to go through a list of some of the things we have to do not to be deceived. And, and, and it's not the same sermon. It's the same title, but any one of these things that I'm sharing with you can be, today we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. Tomorrow we'll talk about being led by the Spirit. Another day we could talk about the importance of praying in the Holy Ghost or reading your Bible, and they're all separate subjects, and I'm purposely linking them to this because there's a twofold benefit of doing this. Number one, you won't be deceived if you're doing these things, but number two, that's not why we're doing this. It's not just to get back to neutral. Once you learn these things, not only will you not be deceived, but when the Holy Ghost starts to move, you'll be in the thick of it. Amen. I can't help but to think, with well, the widow was out of food. She basically said, I've um, got one more meal to cook. We're going to eat it and then die. Listen, the things of God don't always make sense to your head. <clears throat> If a preacher came in today and did what the prophet did, <clears throat> he'd be on the news. Facebook would have a blast. He basically said, you only got food, room, food for one more meal? Give it to me. Give me your last. Give me the last drop of everything you own, and then God will bless you. Boy, that message wouldn't go over good today. But she did it. And then he gave her instructions. Gather as many empty pots as you can, as many empty jars as you can. We are at this place right now where God is instructing us to make provision for the oil that's about to be poured out. And to the degree we made provision, the Bible says, <laughs> just use your imagination a little bit. Stay with the word, but use your imagination a little bit. There might have been a little skepticism. I might as well give it to him. I just might die a few minutes earlier. Let me just, you know, I'll give it to him. And then he says, go get all the jars. He's like, do me a favor, son. Go, go to our neighbor's house. Get as many jars as you can. I bet you our attitude started to change a little bit when the thing was empty, and she puts a jar and turns it on and it fills up. It's like, give me another jar. And that one fills up. And now she filled up the oil. She goes, give me another jar. And there was none. There wasn't any more jars. And that is when the oil stopped. Are you getting this? Are you making provision for the Holy Ghost? How many jars do you have? One or two? What, what price are you willing to pay? You know, going to the neighbor's house might be uncomfortable. What, have, what happens if God says, you know, shut the TV off? Is that a jar you're willing to hold out? Or you don't want to do that one. What is it's going to, what's, where's your drawing line? Where's your bottom line of what you're not willing to do for the Lord? I don't want to run out. 
I don't want to hear about a revival in another church down the street. I'm, it won't happen. I'll quit and go join that church. <laughs> I don't like losing. I don't like to be beat. I don't like anyone to outdo me. He did. Well, that's why I can't be beat. So there, take that. <laughs> Give me a second. God's smarter than I am. Boy, that's pretty mouthful there. That's why we can't be beat. We just can't. But if you don't have that winner's attitude and you just lay down, then you'll be beat. The only way you can't be beat is if you refuse to quit. Jesus. We went on to see how the devil's coming with all power, lying wonders, unrighteous deception. You know, so one of the subjects we can cover for you to be strong, and maybe we'll cover it a little bit more in another time. Um, in, in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So basically the devil's a liar. And like I said, we might go into this a little deeper, but we want to start out right from the beginning, know that we have an enemy. And his major weapon against us is deception. And any way he can. Can you imagine if you had to plan something and you're having a meeting and he's sitting at the meeting? What would you do <clears throat> if I gave you an assignment that if there's a company trying to do something, somebody trying to accomplish something, and they're having a meeting and I sent you in and said, whatever you do, don't let it happen. And you were at the meeting, what would you do? I'd be sitting there saying, oh, you're parked at the meter? They're giving out tickets. Oh, I got to go. I got to go. I got to put money in the meter. By the way, if you're getting the ticket, the devil will never tell you. <laughs> he's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's, he's, you go to say something, and he'll say, if I'm at the table, I'll question. <clears throat> if I say, this is what we're going to do, this is the, I'd say, no, I don't think we can do that. I'd always be bringing up something that's causing confusion and strife. When it comes to doctrine, that's why there's so many religions. Because he fights every last bit of it. This is the way to God. No, this is the way to God. We believe God wants to bless us. Oh, they're arrogant. The Bible says that God provided healing for our bodies. No, I believe it just means spiritual. Every last bit of what Jesus did will be fought by the devil. There will be other religions. It sounds good. Isn't God a God of love? Yes, he is. But he's also has sworn, sworn by his own word that Jesus is the only way, and that's it. Yeah, but he's a loving God. You could put any twist on it you want, and, and it will be fought every step of the way. Everything you believe Every blessing, every soul that's saved, you're going to have to fight for. <clears throat> we looked at some of the reasons that some people may fall away. In that case, Palm Sunday, it didn't go the way they wanted to. Another reason, the desires of the flesh. We see people living right, and then before you know it, you hear they left their wife, Married somebody else. There's a guy who did that and blamed it on me. He used something I said to justify what he did. I'm like, Wait, what? <laughs> Just like Pastor Jack said. Oh, no, 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 no. You, I said, first of all, when I was sharing with you what I did, it was how I deal with unsaved people. Doesn't, you know, whether they're doing something wrong, you got to love them anyway. That doesn't give you a man who's married to a woman, a right to say, I'm leaving you and I'm marrying this girl that I work with, but it's okay, just, just love me anyway. That's, that's not what I said. <clears throat> In James 1.14, it says, every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust and enticed. So one of the first things we have to watch is where is our flesh trying to lead us? What is the weakness of your flesh? I could stand in a room of 
any kind of drugs you want to put in there, and I won't be tempted to take not one. You could put me in the middle of a bar with all the alcohol, free, open bar at any wedding, and, and I won't have a sip. Not tempted. Where's your weakness? Do you know it? And, and here's the great thing about this, and this is another side journey, but I'm not going down it. It's not even a matter of what you can handle. What are you doing that's going to affect the guy next to you? How many little kids, if they saw me drinking a beer at church picnic, how many of them do you think when they got to be 14, 15? Oh. I started at nine, by the way. I saw my friend go to the store and buy beer for his dad. He said, it's for my dad. And he, they sold it to him, and he brought it home to his dad. So I went up the next day and said, I want beer, and it's for my dad. My never, dad had never drank a beer in his life. I don't know why I did it. It was just an opportunity. I saw other people doing it. The other people that were drinking looked like they were having fun. So I wanted to have fun. I'm an eye personality. It's fun. It's fun. I wasn't doing anything to try to deal with pain or hurt or sorrow. I wanted to have fun. And because I saw people in my life doing certain things, I followed the example. So the Bible says that we're supposed to live a life that we don't be a stumbling block for anyone. I'll leave that there. Another reason that people have left the church, offense. People try to set people up. We went through that one. Another one, disobedience. You just want to do it your way. God told you to do something, and you're like, eh. Another one, false doctrine. This is, I think, one of the major ones. And right now in the age we live in, there is just so much at your fingertips online. There's just so many people that post things that sound so good, but they're contrary to the word. And if you don't know the word, you won't know it's contrary to the word. There's men out there that appear to be men of God, but they're really not speaking the truth. A, a message of tolerance to all religions sounds loving, but it's not. You're basically saying what you believe is okay when it's not. If they're not believing that Jesus is the only way to heaven, they will go to hell in, in tolerance by you not speaking up because you don't want to rock the boat or you don't want to seem unloving or uncaring or intolerant or narrow-minded, all the things they call us. It's not a loving thing to let someone keep going the wrong way because you don't want to hurt their feelings. Another thing that leads people the wrong way is, is pride, arrogance. Gnosticism has been around a long time, even as long as you can remember. The, the definition of Gnosticism it's a, it's a second century uh, teaching that claims that salvation could be gained through secret knowledge. It's derived from the word gnosis, which means to know. They think they're smarter than everyone else, that knowledge is progressive. And we're enlightened and you're not. We get this. And the stuff they say sometimes is just foolishness. Here, I'll give you an example. Do you know I have 11 fingers? Watch. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and 6 plus 5 is 11. I have 11 fingers. And they say this like, wow, I've got this revelation. I know something that you don't. You're just not smart enough to get it. And they do that with all of these doctrines. They're basically trying to prove that I can get to heaven without following the gospel is the bottom line to what they believe. And these people think they're smarter than everybody else. And it's their pride, and, and, and it's through knowledge that the devil actually steers them away. Another area we have to be careful of to make sure we don't get drawn away. This is going to sound funny, but success. I got scripture for it. See, that's what we got to do. We got to go to scripture. Deuteronomy 31, verse 20. Deuteronomy 31, verse 20. They're good. When I have brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, where'd they go? When I brought them to a land that was poverty and broken down so they could be humbled so I can be exalted, that's not what it says. That's not who God is. 
When he delivers you, he delivers you to a place that's good, not to a place that's bad. There's nothing good about poverty. There's nothing good about lack. There's nothing good about not being able to pay your bills. It is stressful. If you can't pay your bills because you're greedy, that's a whole different teaching. If you can't pay your bills because your covetousness and you're, you're trying to keep up with your neighbors and you have to have the best car and the best things and you have to have 50 pair of shoes and not enough clothes, you can only wear clothes once and you're not being wise and that's why you can't pay your bills, that's a completely different subject. But if you're going to work and you're paying your mortgage and you're not living in one of those mansions on the seashore that costs $17 million dollars, you're buying a house that's reasonable for the area we live in. And in this area, it's going to be anywhere from 375 to 550. That's what it costs to live here if you want to buy a house. And there's nothing wrong for you to believe God, for you to be able to buy a house and not rent a house from somebody else and pay their mortgage. Now, if you're doing that, there's nothing wrong with it. Some people rather rent. I don't want the headache of a house. I don't want to have to fix a house. Which one's wrong? Neither. You want to rent, so you're free, and I, this is my bill at the end of the month. That's what I got to earn. I earn it. I want nothing else coming. I'm happy like this. Then be happy. You're not wrong if you do, and if you're not wrong if you don't. To judge somebody who does or judge somebody who doesn't, that's... Not your job. So he says, now that I brought them with land that's flowing with milk and honey, of which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat, then they will turn to other gods and serve them, and they will provoke me and break my covenant. In other words, when you get what you want, sometimes you get lazy. When you reach the goals you set, if you're not careful, you just put your feet up and relax, and the devil will just wipe you out. If you're not pursuing God, you're open. If you're not currently and actively going after God with all you have, then, then you're a candidate for being deceived. We started looking at some of the things we need to do. And, and I'm telling you, some of these things I'm repeating it. But if I asked you, what series have I been pre preaching the last four Sundays? Who could? You got it, huh? I don't want to be, he's preaching again about not being falling away. Okay, I'll tell him that. But you're getting it. And like I said, as I'm teaching on these things, it's not just so you don't fall away. If you start doing these things, you're going to go in a positive direction, not a negative direction. Amen. The first thing we want to do is learn from past experience. How do you not be deceived? We, we looked at Israel being delivered. It didn't just happen. They had to go after it. They had to believe for it. They had some battles to win. They had to look at the giants in the land. They had to walk around the wall and shout. It just didn't happen. They had to possess it. We also noticed from watching things in the past with your blessings and, and walking ahead in the things, someone's always going to be unhappy about it and always try to stop you. And not just the devil. And not just unbelievers. And not the city, not the town, not the government, not the president. I'm talking about believers sitting in the pew next to you. And if they're not in the pew next to you, they're definitely in the church around the corner. Someone's going to st try to stop you from move moving forward. The next thing we have to do is we have to know the Word of God. You can only be deceived to the extent that you don't know the Word of God or believe the Word of God. And that's two different things, by the way. Know the Word of God or believe the Word of God. You can read it and know what it says, but when you start questioning is, well, how do I know it's true? How can I trust that scripture? You know, they're always coming out, the Gnostics are always coming out of, with these other gospels. They, they feel bad for the people who wrote a book and didn't make it into the Bible, so they rather follow those books than the books that are in the Bible. They follow those books to disprove the books that made it to the Bible. Does that make sense? Because they have a higher knowledge. God in heaven is not big enough to instruct a man that something as important as the Word of God to let them know which books need to be in there or not. So we have to go help God out by getting these other books. And they read those other books with the purpose of disproving the Bible. And why, they have to disprove the Bible to prove why those books had to be in there and should be in there. 
If it ever contradicts, they'll stick with those books more than this book. So the difference between knowing the word and believing the word. The first thing the devil wants to do, you know, someone says, I don't like going to churches where they preach about the devil. My goodness, how stupid is that? (laughs) If I knew that someone is plotting against you to take you out, wouldn't you want to know their plan? If you knew they were going to blow you up when you went down the hill, wouldn't you want me to tell you, hey, don't go down the hill. There's a bomb ready to blow up if you go that way. Don't talk about him. He's my enemy. I don't want to hear about it. Then you just go down the next street, and he can never get you because you're one step ahead of him all the time. But make no mistake about it. He's putting traps in your life. He'll try to get you any way he can, get family members. He'll do what he can to distract you, get you fired. If if your job is your source, you'll be shaken. God's your source. Fire me, I'll get a new one. Can't do a teaching on that. So the difference between being ignorant (laughs) and doubting the validity of the word, is it really God's word? We're talking about our enemy, and the really only weapon that he has is deception. And we see it starting right in the beginning when he said to Eve, did God really say? Jesus goes on to rebuke the devil. When the devil says, go ahead, do that. What did Jesus come back with him? The word. That's his sword. It's not the Bible. It's not the ink on the pages that you're holding. It's when you believe it in your heart and you speak it with your mouth is when the power is released. The devil has power, by the way, but we have authority over his power. You know, it's it's interesting. I know I've heard the example, you know, a car is powerful. If I stood in front of your car and you put it in drive and stepped on the gas and and I did this to try to stop you, there's no way I could. But if I was a police officer and I put up my hand and said, stop, my authority overrides your power. It actually goes a step further because we've seen too many videos where cops said stop and people, boom. (laughs) But the good thing is, even if that happens, then you've got helicopters and everybody else. Eventually you win. But really what happens when the devil comes against you and he's coming at you, you you have a button. They, They have this... If you've ever been into those racetracks where you drive the go-karts around the track, if somebody has an accident, they hit a button and it kills all the electric and all the cars. They can't move. So when you take authority over the, ba- the, the power of the enemy, it, it knocks his car out. He can step on the gas all he wants. It doesn't go anywhere. He can't go nowhere because you have authority over his power. Amen. Yeah, shut up, devil is right. My goodness. <clears throat> I'm going to close soon. We have a song. We're going to give out the palms. Uh, one more scripture. Second Peter 3, verse 17. It says, Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position but grow in the grace and what? Knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're only going to stand strong is if you're hearing the word of God, you're reading the word of God, you know the right word of God, you're rightly dividing the word of God. The more you read the word of God and the more you look into different translations, the more it makes sense, the more it lines up. Sometimes you have questions, but... You stick around long enough. You may not understand it at the moment, but that's not a need to go searching someplace else for a deeper truth. God's word is truth. He was more than able to make sure that as men of God of old were writing, he spoke in their ear and said, write this, and they wrote it. He was more than able to do that. And when it came to picking which books made it into the Bible, he was present. He was present. He led them. He didn't leave such and such an 
important thing up and open till chance.